making television news history here in Antarctica as we kick off a week of special coverage from the most remote place on the planet. Join me on a journey to discover the truth about global warming. Uh, climate change, probably the most pressing threat to mankind. Tonight and all this week, ITV News is embarking on one of our most ambitious projects to demonstrate the damage being done to the planet thousands of miles from here. In more than 50 years of making television news, we've never done anything quite like this, and neither has anyone else. Yes, good evening and welcome to Antarctica, the most remote place on this planet, a vast, pristine continent of ice. But the ice is melting here on the Antarctic Peninsula faster than anywhere else on Earth, and that is why we are here. We're here to find out the truth about global warming, rapidly becoming the most urgent issue of our times. Now, deep inside the glacier behind me and in the meltwaters all around are contained the answers to some of the questions that affect us all. We are also going to be making a little bit of TV news history this week. We're the first organisation to broadcast live news programmes from Antarctica. Why Antarctica and why have we gone to such incredible lengths to come here? Well, it's a place of extremes, the highest, the coldest, the windiest continent on Earth. It's huge, a large landmass buried beneath a vast ice cap, surrounded by ocean. It's two and a half times the size of the USA. Alone it contains almost 70% of the world's fresh water and 90% of the world's ice. It could be the key to the future of our planet. Here on the peninsula in West Antarctica, temperatures are increasing by almost five times the global average. One of its ice shelves, the Larsen, has collapsed already due to global warming. In a worst case scenario, if the entire ice cap of West Antarctica melted, the world would face an enormous threat. It could cause sea levels to rise nearly seven metres. And just look at how that would affect places like Calcutta, Florida, the Netherlands and the UK. Now, scientists admit that's unlikely, but they don't rule out a sea level rise of maybe two metres by the end of this century. Enough to mean real problems. First for us this evening, Lawrence McGinty reports on the Big Melt. It's the coldest and most windswept place on Earth. Technically, it's the biggest desert in the world. Few animals or plants survive here. And with a land area nearly 60 times bigger than Britain, it holds 90% of the world's ice. Now the big fear is that a big melt will be catastrophic for sea levels and perhaps for mankind too. For just a few weeks every summer, this becomes Antarctica's equivalent of the M1. Nine years ago in Antarctica, I was told there were few signs of that threat materialising. Now, the scientists are much more worried. In the Antarctic Peninsula, glaciers are on the retreat. Global warming is happening here faster than anywhere else on Earth. In one area alone, the ice is already on the move. If it all melted, sea levels would rise by a metre. Though so far, warming has barely touched the vastness of the Antarctic Plateau. But it hasn't always been that way. Scientists have drilled three kilometres down into the ice sheet, bringing up ice cores thousands of years old. By analysing the cores, they know warming has happened in the past. And they know levels of carbon dioxide, the main warming gas, are increasing now faster than ever before. They fear we could be approaching a point of no return, a tipping point that would irreversibly change our climate and our world. For many years, scientists thought that the main ice sheets in Antarctica were stable. Now, they no longer think that. Instead, they see Antarctica as a time bomb, and a bomb whose clock is ticking. The effects of the big melt stretch across the globe. It's felt most keenly, perhaps, in what should be paradise, the Carteret Islands to the northeast of Papua New Guinea. Martin Geisler is there. Here in the South Pacific, the people of these tiny islands are suffering. The sea is rising, and soon it'll swallow their homes. They're about to become the world's first climate change refugees. 
They're going to have to leave this paradise and live on handouts, a hundred miles across the sea. They're angry and they know who they blame. People like you, people who live in the industrialized countries which have caused this global warming. Over the next two nights, we'll be meeting the islanders who'll be telling us of their betrayal and their fears for what lies ahead. To investigate what's contributing to the chaos there, our correspondent John Ray reports from China, the fastest growing economy and the fastest growing polluter in the world. If you want a vision of environmental apocalypse, come to China and come to this place, Linfun, the most polluted city on the planet. The acrid air here is toxic. Those who breathe it live under sentence of death from lung disease. The reason? China's economic miracle is fueled by coal. 2,000 million tons of it are burnt every year. They make the cheap goods on which we rely, but at incalculable cost to the environment. So China's least welcome exports. The toxic pollution clouds picked up as far away as the United States and the greenhouse gases, which are now a major contributor to global warming, the global warming melting the Antarctic and threatening us all. And from rapid industrialization in the Far East to the established consumerism of the West, John Irvine looks at America, the world's current biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. He tells us how in California they're trying to step back from the brink of environmental disaster. Here in the United States, 5% of the world's population consumes a quarter of the world's energy. They pump out more carbon dioxide than any other nation. This, the richest country there is, enjoys some of the lowest energy prices in the developed world. These facts have had little impact on President George Bush, who famously rejected the Kyoto Protocols. But some US states are unhappy with the situation and they are showing the rest of this country and the world that things can change. If you want to get to the Antarctic, it's pretty simple, really. Just head south and keep on going and going and going. And power six. After 22 hours from London to southernmost Chile, we lift off for a five-hour hop across the Southern Ocean, the last leg of the journey to the bottom of the world. Well, quite a lot of cargo on this flight down to the Antarctic, all the protective clothing, of course, without which, uh, even in summer, you simply would not survive. Lots of fresh food on this flight, carrots, lettuces, uh, potatoes, something of a luxury for the people down there. Of course, this lifeline, this flight, only exists for four months of the year. For eight months of the year, the scientists down in the Antarctic are simply cut off from the outside world. But there's no going back now. So quickly does the weather change down here that this is a flight with a point of no return. The pilot checks the conditions ahead and must then make the decision to carry on or turn back. Even though the weather's not great, we're going in and moments later the cloud gives way to a seascape like no other. The first glimpse of Antarctica is a spectacular one, an awe-inspiring construct of nature that yields to no man. Welcome to a very different world. The first thing you do when you reach the Antarctic is realise how dangerous it is. There are crevasses all over the place. And this is one of them. And uh, we've been trained, basically, have a survive in them. Probably not the way. <laughs> it's the first lesson of life in the Antarctic, and for the people working here, it's a hard one. Particularly for the scientists, a lot of them are going into fairly remote and inhospitable environments. So basically, we need to ensure that they can cope with whatever the environment throws at them. Well, there we are. We've arrived, and uh, to some extent, at least, we've been trained. But two thoughts immediately occur to me. One is just how stunningly beautiful this place is. And the second one is a more unsettling thought that maybe what man is doing thousands of miles from here could be leading to the melting of the ice and may then perhaps lead to a rise in sea levels, which uh, may come back to haunt us. It, uh, it really is an alarming thought.